This video will focus on the drowning of Michael Llewellyn Davies and his friend Rupert Buxton in 1921. Michael Llewellyn Davies was one of the wards of J.M. Barry. His parents, Arthur Llewellyn Davies and Sylvia Llewellyn Davies, sadly met tragic ends before Michael himself was grown up. Later in life, his only surviving brother, Nico, described Michael as the cleverest of us, the most original, the potential genius. He was a first cousin of Daphne du Maurier, and if you're interested in her, you can check out her video on my channel, and you can also check out a video on Michael's father, Arthur Llewellyn Davies, on my channel. Michael was the fourth of five sons of Arthur and Sylvia Llewellyn Davies. He was born three years after the playwright J.M. Barry became friends with his older brothers and mother in 1897. He and his eldest brother George were the boys closest to Barry, and he is widely reported as the individual who most influenced the portrayal of Peter Pan in the 1911 novel based on the play by Barry. He was an infant as Barry was writing the first appearance of Peter Pan, Peter named potentially after his brother or the main character Peter Ibbotson in the novel, as a newborn in The Little White Bird. He was four and a half years old when Peter Pan, or The Boy Who Wouldn't Grow Up, debuted in December 1904. The following winter, he was ill for several months, so in February 1906, Barry and producer Charles Froman brought scenery and some of the cast to the family's home in Berkhamsted to perform the play for him. Barry incorporated material from Michael's own life, including his sleepwalking and nightmares, into the novel Peter and Wendy. The statue of Peter Pan in Kensington Dark Gardens was meant to be modeled upon nude photographs of Michael Llewellyn Davies provided by J.M. Barry. However, the sculptor George Frampton used a different child as his model, probably thankfully, leaving Barry very disappointed with the result. It doesn't show the devil in Peter, the writer said. Michael Llewellyn Davies lived with J.M. Barry in 1910 in Camden Hill Square and then in Adelphi Terrace after the death of his parents. So he would have been aware of Barry's 1900 novel, Tommy and Grizel. Tommy, the main character in the novel, is based on J.M. Barry. In a review of this book, it is reported that it is a clever and baffling character study of Tommy and of Grizel, who was based on Sylvia Llewellyn Davies, who adores Tommy and studies his every act and motive. Tommy is a unique and original creation, possessed of a genius which unfits him for practical life. He is a creature of ever-varying moods, just like Barry, who is prone to long silences, who may be loved but never understood and still less approved of. Grizel is destined to have her career blighted by her love for this erratic genius, with his gift at writing and his fatal gift of making believe. The novel ends with a tragic death of Tommy being lured into a garden and then impaled upon the picket fence where he meets his tragic end. There is a scene from this book of a drowning in a pool that Michael would have been aware of. In one of Tommy's weirdly productive dreams, there's a very noble young man, his white dead face staring at the sky from the bottom of a deep pool. Michael struggled with nightmares as soon as he became the ward of J.M. Barry. Many of his nightmares included sleepwalking and him standing at the top of a staircase asking whatever was bothering him to come out and fight. He truly believed there was an unknown foe that he was destined to fight, and Barry included this material in his work. Michael eventually attended Eton, and Despite his athletic ability at cricket and billiards, he was not a fan of the school. His older brother, George, was a fantastic cricket player, but unfortunately killed in action in World War I in 1915. Michael was expected to follow in his athletic footsteps, but he didn't quite do so. Barry's love for schoolboys was not only thematic. He enjoyed incorporating schoolboy slang into his novels. But when he discovered from regular letters that Michael was not enjoying his stay at Eton, he took to walking around the grounds in the very early morning, and he satisfied himself by thinking that Michael may spot him in the fog and be comforted by his presence. Michael was described as the one by his brothers and by Barry, as the one who meant the most to Barry. While he had difficulty adjusting to life away from Barry, 
He and he exchanged letters daily with his uncle Jim. He dis, he did want to become independent. He made a number of friends and excelled at his studies, including art and writing poetry, and was generally described as a brilliant boy, one destined for great things. This did not keep him from making friends in the outside world as well. He became friends with some of Barry's contemporaries' children, such as E.V. Lucas's The Publisher and his daughter, Audrey Lucas. After finishing at Eton, Davies attended Christ Church, Oxford, where he continued to correspond regularly with Barry. Michael's friends thought that the correspondence was a little bit morbid and very clingy, and Michael briefly decided to study art at the University of Paris. Michael's grandfather, George de Marier, was a famed artist, and he wanted to follow in his footsteps. Luckily for Michael, he had contacts in Paris, and he was able to stay with them in the Christmas before his death. He stayed with Elizabeth Lucas, the estranged wife of publisher Evie Lucas, in Paris the Christmas before he died. This was a time in Michael's life when he was becoming more independent and starting to wriggle free of Barry's grasp. Barry was not a fan of this. He wanted Michael to follow the path that George had from public school to public life, all while staying very close to Barry. At Eton, or I'm sorry, at Oxford, Michael had already made friends, but he also became very close to Rupert Buxton, the son of Sir Thomas Fowl Victor Buxton, fourth baronet, and a formal former pupil of Harrow School. The two became inseparable friends, spending time both at the university and on European holidays together. Buxton was also a poet and had an interest in acting. He reported being shown in several films throughout his youth. Buxton was one of the very few friends of Davies whom Barry reported getting along with. I believe that Buxton met Barry much earlier in life. Or, I'm sorry, met Michael much earlier in life and maybe Barry much earlier in life. Michael's aunt, Margaret Llewellyn Davies, was a staunch suffragist and had many contacts with the Labour Party in the UK. In 1914, she was one of the founding members of an anti-imperialist group called the Union of Democratic Control. It was a British pressure group formed to press for a more responsive foreign policy. While not a pacifist organization, it was opposed to military influence in the government. One of the founders was Charles Roden Buxton MP, who was Rupert's uncle. I believe that Margaret would have sussed out Buxton and figured that this was a good family for her nephews to be connected to. Margaret was very concerned about the state of her nephews after her brother's death in 1907, and so she would have been on the lookout for men that the boys could have looked to. I believe this is how the Buxton and Llewellyn Davies family first became acquainted. Another potential way Rupert and Michael met before meeting at Oxford was through the Lucas family. Like I mentioned, Elizabeth Lucas was Michael's host in Paris for Christmas the year before he died. Lucas had, was the publisher at Methuen's Publishing House, and in doing so, he was very aware of writings by Rupert's uncles, both of which were serving as members of parliament. It may be through this that Rupert uh, had met Michael Evie Lucas was a very real presence in Michael Llewellyn Davies' life. He regularly gave him birthday presents, including billiard sets. His daughter, Audrey, vacationed with the Llewellyn Davies boys and Barry in Scotland regularly. Rupert Buxton came from a background of wealth and beauty. He was born sixth son and youngest of seven children to Sir Thomas Fowle's heir, Victor and Anne in 1900. The family was very involved with international causes, and his mother, Lady Buxton, was a very devout Christian. He enjoyed riding to hounds and shooting big game. His father enjoyed riding to hounds and shooting big game. Rupert was someone who suffered from medical illness early in life. He developed a chalky uh, accretion around his eye in 1920 and underwent an operation at the London Hospital for the Blind to remove it. Some photographs of him seem to show that he may have suffered from a recurring swelling around one of his eyes. Thus being the case, he supported the London Association for the Blind up until his death. 
He incorporated this darkness in his poetry where he wrote about dead children. Rupert Buxton also was someone who experienced um, more than just a chalky, um, chalky discharge around the eye. At the age of 12, he ran his bicycle at high speed into a light carriage, sustaining a serious head injury. Apparently, there was no harm done to his intellect, but he did suffer severe headaches later and possibly memory difficulties and depression. He also described emotional responses to color, which may have been a form of synesthesia. This would have endeared him to Michael Llewellyn Davies, who had nightmares and slept walk. There is a story that Michael Llewellyn Davies was terrified of the water, and this fear came about despite J.M. Barry exposing the boys to fishing expeditions in Scotland, as well as um, the water around Black Lake Cottage. Michael Llewellyn Davies, at the time of his death, could swim up to 20 yards. There are many photographs of him being able to swim at Ramsgate Beach as a child, so I'm not sure that he could not swim. He did have some of a fear of water, but he wasn't completely incapable in the water. Both Michael and Rupert were too young to serve in World War I. However, they were severely impacted by it. Rupert's brother Jocelyn was lost in the carnage of the Battle of the Somme in 1916, and his brother Maurice survived the war but died of pneumonia in August 1919. Meanwhile, Rupert's father had died following a freak accident in 1919. He was run over by his own new motor car as he and a servant were trying to figure out how to operate it. The Buxton family was also losing much of their fortune to newly progressive land taxes intended to fight the economic inequities caused by hereditary wealth. A lot of socialism beyond those um, acts. Michael was also too young to serve in World War I, but his brother George was not, and George was killed in action. Michael's uncle, Guy du Maurier, was also killed in action in World War I, and J.M. Barry told, told horrific stories about Guy's intestines slopping out of him at the time of his death. After leaving Harrow as a head boy, Rupert studied at Cambridge University, but started at Christchurch, Oxford in the fall of 1919. He was depressed at first, but his friendship with Michael Llewellyn Davies brightened his mood. In March 1920, the two went on a hiking expedition from Chichester to Beachy Head, about 60 miles in the South Downs, and for Easter 1921, they traveled together to Dorset on the Channel. Unfortunately for them, Barry had the, had the ability to pop up wherever they were. So even if Michael was considering moving to Paris and studying there, Barry was always around to thwart his plans. Rupert and Michael shared a love for poetry, and Rupert had an interest in the theater, a profession Michael had numerous ties to through Barry and through his mother's family, the Dumouriers. In a 1976 interview, Michael's friend Robert Boothby, by then a retired conservative party politician, reported that Michael had a sexual relationship with Rupert. Boothby recalled discouraging their friendship, warning Michael of a feeling of doom he had about Rupert. Rupert's other friends and family remembered him much more warmly. Nico, Michael's brother, reacted to Boothby's comments with surprise, remembering Rupert as a positive influence and speculating that Boothby's opinion was clouded by jealousy because Boothby was bisexual and caught up in multiple homosexual scandals during his reign in British politics. Rupert took a trip partway down the Nile in the summer of 1920 from Uganda to Khartoum in Sudan, the branch known as the White Nile perhaps intended by his family to spark an interest in the missions they supported in Africa. Rupert was also writing letters on the state of communism and capitalism in the Soviet Union. Instead, Rupert developed an interest in cinema, investing money into a production in which he was also acting in every week. Rupert was a keen musician, and on the piano, his best-loved piece was Chopin's third ballade in A-flat. He entertained the other passengers while in Africa by playing ragtime dances. You were right about the music, but not quite, because it is well known that I play ragtime. I'm playing the dance music for the fancy dress ball tonight, he said in a letter to his sister-in-law, Dorothy, in the summer of 1920. 
He also would sing in the drawing room at one of the family properties at Warley's. He loved to climb trees, mountains, even the outsides of buildings, and was very concerned by the despoiling of the countryside by the growth of industry and housing, an event he would have witnessed from atop Harrow Hill as the pretty villages of Wem Wembley, Kingsbury, and Neesden were engulfed by a London suburban expansion. Several let letters written by Rupert in 1917 show that emotionally he had, he had an extremely turbulent adolescence. He correlated the color yellow with being cheerful, blue with being hopeful, green with being strong, purple with being angry, and mauve with being sad. He admitted that he was appallingly lazy and changeable, unable to go on at one thing for long, a charlatan, wildly ambitious in the poetic world. This matched things that his older sister said about him years later. Sometimes he said he doesn't think anything matters, sometimes everything, but I love is the only thing that is always there, he said in 1917. A letter to his brother Clarence in August 1917 described his activities during the summer holidays, including a growing interest in social reform, just like his uncle's. Rupert was expected to have a substantial career in later life. Regardless, by the time he met Michael, he knew that he wanted something greater, just like Michael did. It seems that Rupert and Michael were planning something. In April 1920, Rupert wrote the following letter to his mother. I have had a most successful time in Surrey with Michael Davies. I am sorry to say I did not get through a great deal of work as the country was so lovely and there was such a lot to do. Our last few days were the best. Actually, the last two, we took an expedition walking from the neighbor of Chichester to Beachy Head, the whole length of the South Downs, keeping to the crest of the ridge all the time. We did 35 miles a day. I have never known such a walk for views, southward over the hills to the sea and northward over the whole expanse of Sussex and Surrey on a narrow grassy plain with steep sides covered with primroses, violets, cowslips, and wood anemones. A most inspiring place to walk on. I can well understand the enthusiasm of Belloc and Kipling for the great hills of the South Country and the patriotism they breed. Your devoted son, Rupert. Rupert had been struggling with some kind of illness in 1920. Was this what Rupert called homosexuality? It's not clear, but many do think that Rupert was homosexual. I personally don't think he was. At the time, he was very young, and there, it, there's just no evidence one way or the other. But in um, 1919, he did have to stay with the future Bishop of Ripon in Christ Church Deanery. And this man said that Rupert had a continuing depression. And after Rupert died, he said, I wish I had helped him more when he was with me, but I have always had a horror of forcing any man's confidence. And though I think that this is an error on the right side, I have always felt that I have missed many opportunities. It haunts me rather that he was often depressed and unhappy when he was with me and I never succeeded in doing anything for him. So you have this mix of Rupert being very happy when he's with Michael Davies and very unhappy without him. Michael Llewellyn Davies was also expressing depression. He had to give a speech on speech day in the summer of 1918 and his performance was described as follows. Michael Llewellyn Davies did not appear to love or be about to love his speech, but considering his lack of enthusiasm, he did quite well. Why could he not have let himself go in something he really liked? He need have had no fear. No murder would have been committed. Rupert appears to be the driver to get Michael out of this mental space. space. He requested a private dinner with Davies' guardian, Barry, and this was granted. Nobody knows what Barry and Rupert talked about, but Barry considered Rupert a friend from then on. Was Rupert trying to convince Barry to let Michael go study in Paris? Maybe. I think this is true because there was a trip to Norway that Rupert was planning at the beginning of 1921. He wrote, the Norway project is rather vague still. I'm sorry to say, Michael may not be able to go, in which case it will have to be given up. This is from a letter in February 1921 to Rupert's mother. So Rupert was trying to get Michael to go to Europe with him, and he was speaking to his own mother about it. He was speaking to Barry about it, but it was not working. And I think that this was because Michael felt tethered to Barry. 
um, Michael knew that Barry would never let him go. To Barry, Michael was the one. Michael was the one he could not let go of. Michael was the one he would not let study in Paris, despite there being contacts of the family in Paris. And so I think that this might have plunged Michael into an even deeper depression. After the Easter holidays, Michael was preparing for final schools, which was coinciding with his 21st birthday, and that would mean he had both reached the age of majority and fulfilled his obligation to his family to achieve his degree. Public schools were very important to Barry, and this would have been an obligation Michael was expected to do. He would have felt an approaching freedom from constraint and was probably planning to go abroad in the summer, first to Paris, then later further afield, maybe to Norway. One detail of this period has survived. There was industrial unrest in Eastern 1921 and the government, overreacting, stationed troops in Hyde Park to deal with any civil disorder. Michael volunteered as a private in the London Scottish Regiment, although there was no compulsion on him to do so, and briefly joined his regiment under canvas. Michael's enthusiasm for the military life and preparedness to fire on strikers and demonstrators, this was the period of the Amritsar riots in, in India and the black and tan operations in Ireland, should be taken into account when considering his personality and political persuasions. Rupert was also patriotic. Barry's remark about Major Davies may not have been simply humorous, but the emergency did not last long, and the two boys spent the remainder of the holiday studying at an inn by Corfe Castle, Dorset, where Barry, surprise, surprise, joined them. Rupert's family desperately wanted Rupert to eventually settle down and find his place in the world. Given Rupert's sympathy for emotionally wounded people, Lady Buxton was concerned about those with whom he associated. Rupert had befriended Alistair Graham, who was blind in one eye and had a severe squint in the other, again harking back to Rupert's own ocular issues, at Oxford and invited him to Woodredon, where he enjoyed playing the two manual organs at Worley's. Alastor was a difficult person and is likely to have made a bad impression. His horrific suicide on the railway line across Port Meadow, Oxford in May 1920 would have added to the family's worries. As for Michael, the Buxton family remembered that Lady Buxton did not wholeheartedly approve of their friendship mainly because of Michael's association with Barry. Strongly religious, Lady Buxton disapproved of, Mar of Barry's divorce from Mary Ansell. Also, as an Eaton parent herself with two boys in the same house that Barry's wards were in, she may have already encountered Barry and Michael at the school. Barry's later attempt to befriend Rupert's older sister, Lucy, by writing to her, I should like by and by to be allowed to see Rupert's sister with the hope that she might come in time to look on me as a friend was discouraged. Barry was trying to insert himself with the Buxton family very soon after Rupert died, and many of Barry's letters to Lady Buxton simply were unanswered. As the two young men wandered down to Sanford in Oxford, one may imagine the two friends as happy enough in themselves, perhaps not doing quite as well academically as their schoolwork had promised, but otherwise looking to the future. On May uh, 19th, 1921, the weather was pleasantly warm, and the boys left Oxford for the four or five mile walk down the Thames to Sanford. Friends who met them as they were leaving Christchurch noticed nothing unusual in their behavior, and according to some of their contemporaries, they had been to Sanford together to swim several times before. About a mile above the village, the Thames flowing north to south divides into two equal streams, coming together again just above the lock, the land in between forming a forested island. Islands were of tremendous importance to Barry and Michael. Barry encouraged his wards to think of an imaginary island and build their imaginations around the island, such as the island in Peter Pan. So this island would have had special meaning to Michael. Three quarters of the way down the western course, there is a dam, half of concrete piers separating mechanical sluice gates, the other half a breakwater of descending granite steps. Across the top runs a railed walkway, in the middle of which stands a memorial obelisk to the drowned. The dam controlled the flow of water to a paper mill, which was situated 200 yards downstream by the lock. The mill, which is now demolished, was an unsightly Victorian building with a tall chimney. 
The whole assembly showed the industrial intrusion that Rupert resented. But just beneath the steel and stone of the barrier, the river momentarily forms a still pool, 60 yards approximately across, with wooded heights and willows on the banks trailing their branches in the inviting water. Cascades spilling over the granite breakwater splash with a silvery echo, and it is these pleasing things with its isolation from Oxford, which gives Sanford Pool its special attraction as a place to bathe and relax on a hot afternoon. In the 1920s, people would fish on the lock, and while it's now locked and closed to visitors, it's still a very beautiful spot. The boys followed the western bank of the diversion down to the pool, undressed, leaving their clothes in little piles on the bank, and both jumped in. This is despite the rumors that Michael Llewellyn Davies could not swim. Supposedly, the plan was for the athletic Rupert, six feet two inches tall, of gigantic physical strength and a powerful swimmer, to give Michael a swimming lesson. Rupert could move around freely, but Michael was supposed to stay in the shallows by the bank where his feet could touch the riverbed. Then they would horse around a bit before drying off and make their way back to Oxford for tea where people expected him. Rupert may not have realized that Michael's phobia was so serious that he was a dangerous liability in deep water. I think that this is over-exaggerated, but Michael's uncle Theodore drowned in 1905, and this may have frightened the impressionable five-year-old boy. That might be, but there are so many photos of Michael swimming at Ramsgate Beach around that age. Everything seemed to come so easily to Michael. He was naturally very attractive, and, the, and his intellectual and sporting achievements in cricket and otherwise always appeared effortless to the envy of his younger brother, Nico. The one thing Michael could not do was swim very well, even though he could swim up to 20 yards. And rather than accept this, Michael worried if there was some unbearable personable, personal imperfection with him. Rupert assumed that if there were any problems, his prowess would prevent any mishap. His faults were excessive carelessness, arrogance, and obstinacy remarked upon by his family. The witnesses working on the bank on the day saw one of the men swim over to the granite steps and sit there in the warm sun. That must have been Rupert, as Michael could not swim that far. The other followed him to sit there too, but, about, but got about halfway across until he got into difficulties. This was Michael, supposedly, trying to keep up. Unable to admit this was something he could not do, he started to panic. There was a shout. Rupert swam over to Michael to see what was wrong. But then Michael clung hold of Rupert and dragged them both down. In that instant of confusion, Rupert, despite his strength, was helpless, and they both drowned. The manner in which they drowned provoked a lot of speculation, and this was not in any small part due to the inquest was headed by prejudiced parties from Oxford. So we never really got an unbiased view of what happened. Witnesses remember saying that both of the boys appeared to be standing in the same exact place when they drowned. That is, that there was no excessive movement. They were just standing there and then had their heads slightly below the water. One of them gave a shout and then both of them were dead. When they dragged the lock for bodies, the bodies were somewhat clinging to one another. And so, although both boys could be gravely depressed at times, it was always obvious to others in their behavior that there wasn't anything extremely wrong. Rupert, in particular, was planning for the future. Did Michael, due to his family's financial difficulties, persuade him to kill himself? That would be pretty extreme. The current mode of thinking is that the two were homosexual lovers, and because of the Oscar Wilde trial and its uh, subsequent fallout, they would not have wanted to live a gay lifestyle. This is completely inaccurate. Robert Boothby, their own friend, was a homosexual and he lived a very successful life. So why would they have been so afraid of that? It's important to note that Nico, Michael's younger brother, said in an interview in the 1970s that I've always had something of a hunch that Michael's drowning was suicide. He was in a way that type, exceptionally clever with varying moods. So maybe Michael wanted to drown himself, but why Rupert? Was Rupert really trying to save him? Was this just a horrible accident gone wrong? No one has ever been able to really figure this out. 
some people th- think that maybe there had the men had had an argument on the way, maybe about Norway, maybe about Paris, and Michael had been envious of Rupert and then had tried to drag him down. This seems very mean-spirited and malicious for someone as sweet and empathetic as Michael. If so I I don't think that, you know, that would have happened. Um, there was no formal post-mortem examination of the bodies, and it remains a possibility that Michael, who was often said to be in poor health, suffered a cardiac event, uh, perhaps brought on by the exertion of swimming. This is just speculative. Nobody knows for sure. Again, there's speculation that there was an unconscious death wish or a conscious death wish. Um, the or it was just a, an accident and so the inquest's verdict of accidental death is what has been largely accepted with many other people saying no it was a definite suicide of one or both in a suicide pact i will end this video by reading one of rupert buxton's poems which included a premonition of his own death the poem is called the pilgrimage of tala a legend he must either die upon the rock or dive into this iridescent lake and drown himself beneath its flowing rills. He chose the latter course and throwing off his flask of wine and precious hunting knife, he knew not why, he plunged into the pool to drown himself at once and yet for aye. But look what wondrous thing has come to pass. Instead of suffocating neath the wave, he glided through the slumbering rills of green, down through the water further till he thought he must be dashed against the bottom rocks, but no, through lovely flowers of blue and green, he glided, sinking more and sinking yet. Oblivion came, and after that he slept, yet onward through the limpid green he sank and died, yet lived in spirit one more day, till two great scenes could show him all this life and what it comes to in the sight of God.